In 1938, like today, the northeastern United States is the most densely populated region in the country and one of the most diverse. Along the eastern seaboard lived blue bloods and bus drivers, old New England money, and ambitious new immigrants. They have one common denominator, the ocean. The jagged coastline is a place for work and leisure. It's a powerful force that demands respect. A lot of our commerce is governed by the ocean, by the seaports, by the fishing industry, by the fisheries. And for that reason, much of our lives are held at will by what nature brings to us off the ocean. These mussels have just been harvested. But New England has seldom seen the ocean's deadliest power. One of those rare days comes on September 21st, 1938. catastrophic storm with 120 mile an hour winds blasts across the area without warning. New England's killer hurricane destroys 20,000 structures and leaves nearly 700 people dead. The hurricane produced a democracy of suffering in the sense that uh, everyone struggled through the hurricane. That, of course, nature spares no one. It goes after the rich, it goes after the poor. It's among the most devastating natural disasters of its era. The storm of near record speed and size keeps meteorologists guessing and catches an entire population by surprise. Modern-day forecasters predict that it is only a matter of time before another hurricane this powerful ravages New England again. September 1938. In the Northeast, it's been an odd summer, one of the wettest on record. When it isn't raining, the beaches brim with activity. The shore is a welcome distraction from the news. In Europe, the Nazis have moved into Austria. And Adolf Hitler has set his sights on Czechoslovakia. Haunted by the dark memories of World War I, Americans hope to avoid the conflict. They would say it's a European problem. It doesn't really affect us and let's let someone else do this. After all, we had bailed Europe out in 1918, and if they can't learn to get along, we should simply stay out of their, of their quarrels. At home, the nation is still in the grip of the Great Depression. I think it's hard for us to realize how long the Depression lasted. You really had a whole generation of young people who'd had that kind of financial desperation. And I think that that very much colored the outlook in the public opinion at the time. Americans find escape from their troubles in the movies. 60 million people, half of all Americans, go to the movies every week. In a time of want, the movies had the, the heroines that had lots of money and wore beautiful clothes and life was very luxurious and they jilted rich suitors and there was real escapism to the movies. In 1938, no movie is causing more buzz than the upcoming film adaptation of Gone with the Wind, the most popular book of the day. As soon as the novel came out, there's the subject of when will it be made into a movie, how will it be made into a movie, and especially who's going to play Scarlett O'Hara. This was a, a question of national fascination. Among those up for the part is 31-year-old Katherine Hepburn. Though she'd had early successes, Hepburn has recently starred in a string of flops. Hepburn retreats to her family's sprawling summer home in Fenwick, Connecticut, to consider her next career move. 
man to weigh a marriage proposal from multimillionaire aviator Howard Hughes. How are you? The Hepburns are old money. Their lavish getaway overlooks Long Island Sound. The home had a very, uh, almost a sentimental value to the Hepburns as much as a practical value as a vacation home. So, so uh, how was Howard? Twice. Twice. And it was, if you will, their refuge. For the people of Jamestown, Rhode Island, about 70 miles east, the water is more than a summer refuge. It's their livelihood. The town sits on an island nine miles long and one mile wide in Narragansett Bay. Jamestown has its share of summer residents, but mostly it's home to fishermen and blue collar workers. Farmer Joe Matos, like many on the island, is a Portuguese immigrant. He lives in Jamestown with his wife and five children. It was a very small town where you knew everyone, um, and everyone really knew everything that was going on in everyone else's lives. 46-year-old Norm Caswell, the local school bus driver, is one of the island's familiar faces. If he's not behind the wheel of his bus, He's dropping off packages for the delivery service he runs. Good morning to you. Good morning. How do you do, sir? Norman Caswell. He was a uh, an amiable type of fellow. Thank you so much. Very reliable fellow. Hey, Joe. How are you doing? Joe? Good. Good to see you. He was a man who had descended in many generations from people on the island. The Caswells had been there for a long time. They were entrepreneurial people. Like his neighbors, Caswell is enjoying the last warm days. As summer fades, most people see passing storms as harmless diversions. And there's a certain drama to these storms. They like the water in their faces. They liked watching the storms come in and feeling part of those elements and, and feeling alive. They are just weeks away from New England's harshest weather. Starting in October, slow-moving storms known as nor'easters can pummel these shores. They are lumbering, brutal beasts that can hover over the coast for days. Nor'easters are driven by temperature contrast. Cold Arctic air making its way toward the warmer Gulf Stream waters uh, off our eastern seaboard. And they bring a myriad of wintry precipitation from heavy coastal rains, but also tremendous snow and ice storms in the interior. That's what they're noted for. But rarely, very rarely, has the end of summer brought truly devastating weather to New England. Hurricanes. After the great colonial hurricane of 1635 destroyed Plymouth, Massachusetts, many pilgrims believed it was a sign of the apocalypse. In 1815, the great September gale, which was in fact a hurricane, leveled whole towns from New York to New Hampshire. But by the 1930s, all that is ancient history. The 1938 population in New England knew nothing of hurricanes. Uh, New England had not been hit by a major hurricane since the early 1800s. So you basically had at least two generations of no experience. In fact, one observer said, you know, we don't have these things because we had the sense to move to a climate where you won't have hurricanes, earthquakes, and other kinds of things that attract people who don't have this good sense to live in New England. Cataclysmic storms like these are rare here for a reason. These systems are born and bred over the warm tropical waters of the Atlantic Ocean in the Gulf of Mexico. Hurricanes don't like to go northward. Most of the time, hurricanes would disintegrate once they get into the cool waters of the New England coastline. But under just the right convergence of wind and current, a rogue hurricane can burst through and threaten the Northeast. In September 1938, 
4,000 miles away off the coast of Africa, that is exactly what is happening. But those working and playing on New England shores are unaware that a hurricane's deadly power is about to be unleashed upon them. Just as we returned home, the sky blackened and the rain and wind increased. Then I saw it. Just a matter of time before the slate from the roof was ripped loose and flying through the air. I could hear everything from inside. Our house began to twist around from side to side. I said the only thing to do now is to pray. It's September 1938. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt struggles to pull America out of the Depression. Congress has recently enacted the first national minimum wage, 25 cents an hour. World attention is focused on Nazi Germany's growing domination of Europe. Many people believe war is inevitable. And on the morning of the 16th, the residents of New England's coastal communities are in the last days of a rainy summer. It had been a strange summer in terms of the weather. Uh, unusual heat at various periods throughout the summer, heavy rainfall that created widespread flooding, particularly in the Connecticut River Valley Basin, so all through Connecticut into western Massachusetts. In Jamestown, Rhode Island, Norm Caswell fires up his school bus for the morning run into town. As usual, he crosses a one-lane causeway flanked on both sides by Narragansett Bay. The road is built on a sandbar, making it susceptible to flooding during the rainy summer. It's the only way for Caswell to pick up the kids on his route. His passengers are a microcosm of the community, the sons of a Greek fisherman, the children of the town lighthouse keeper, and three daughters and one son of Portuguese farmer Joseph Matos. Good morning, Mr. Caswell. Good morning, Teresa. Hey, Joe. Good morning, Mr. Caswell. Over the years, Caswell has watched the children grow up. He was very uh, friendly with the kids and protective. So you get very attached to the kids and you know their families and you know, you, you go that extra mile. 70 miles away in Fenwick, Connecticut, actress Katherine Hepburn is nursing a troubled career and a failing romance. At her family's waterfront home, she distracts herself with books, golf, and swimming. For Katherine Hepburn, it was the most magical place on earth. It was a place where you could run wild, physically and imaginatively. It was summer camp every day of the year. It seems like a pleasant end to a wet season. But 4,000 miles away, a tempest is brewing in the Atlantic near the Cape Verde Islands off the coast of Africa. The islands are the birthplace of many tropical storms. They mark the edge of a huge, deep pool of warm water, and heat is the fuel that can transform a tropical storm into a deadly hurricane. Cape Verde hurricanes are purely tropical. Their processes in both formation and intensification are purely tropical, which means that they have the potential to be most efficient at turning the energy from the ocean's surface into wind energy and uh, therefore produce the strongest hurricanes. During the first week of September, just such a storm is spawned. It starts as a cluster of thunderstorms. As it crosses these warm waters, it sucks up more and more energy. 
By the 14th, its winds reached 74 miles an hour, officially making it a hurricane. On the morning of September 16th, Weather Bureau Director Grady Norton and his assistant Gordon Dunn arrive at their offices in Jacksonville, Florida. Take the day off. Yeah, I was thinking about it. About time. Right, Many consider Norton one of the best forecasters in the country. The 23-year veteran of the Bureau often relies on his gut feelings over analytical methods. On the other hand, Gordon Dunn has a much more methodical approach to weather prediction. He is a rising star in the field of meteorology. Probably often they didn't agree, but certainly together those strengths made for a very, very effective hurricane forecast team. Three years earlier, both Norton and Dunn had witnessed the calamitous Labor Day hurricane of 1935 that devastated the Florida Keys. They had warned people of the approaching storm, but had vastly underestimated its intensity. It killed more than 400 people. It made Norton and Dunn that much more determined to make sure that that was not going to happen again in that er their area, and it was not going to happen on their watch. This day, their attention is focused on reports of the powerful new storm spawned near the Cape Verde Islands. But their information is limited. I think we need to keep an eye on this one. Their key tool is the barometer coupled with close observation of wind and waves. The Weather Bureau, as of 1938, was still essentially using equipment that had existed almost for centuries. It wouldn't be until the next generation that the Weather Bureau really developed the modern equipment of meteorology, such things as radar, the use of jet planes. Most observational data still come from the thousands of military and commercial ships at sea but delivery of information is slow. It took hours for reports to make it to an office where they could physically hand plot the map and then do their own analyses. So it was sort of like running in slow motion. What speed? On September 16th, Grady Norton picks up a ship to shore message that describes pounding seas northeast of Puerto Rico. Made its way almost unseen and if it weren't for ship reports at that time, we likely would have had a hard time assessing that there even was a, a hurricane of that magnitude sitting out there. Norton and Dunn fear a replay of the tragic 1935 hurricane. A tropical disturbance of dangerous proportions is gathering in the Caribbean. Traveling at 20 The next morning, Norton broadcasts a storm warning for Miami and the rest of the state. Tuesday morning. The people in Florida knew what hurricanes were, knew what to expect. The Red Cross was available. There were reserves of telephone workers and reserves of uh, cleanup workers ready to go. On the evening of Monday, September 19th, sure. the forecasters received some welcome news. The storm will miss Florida and turn north, pushed by a convergence of fronts moving up the east coast. By the following morning, the two forecasters have spent nearly 100 straight hours tracking the storm. At 9.30 a.m., Grady Norton issues an alert. All vessels from the Virginia Capes to Charleston, South Carolina, should stay in harbor. I repeat, all vessels in path at all... But this warning comes at a price. The ships at sea, they were the information gatherers. So when they were called into port, you lost your source of information there to make forecast and to make intelligent reports. The storm is moving to the north. Looks like we miss our coast entirely. Norton and Dunn expect that the hurricane will die as it heads north and hits the cool waters off the northeast coast. It 
1,100 miles north, Norm Caswell delivers his busload of children safely home. Catherine Hepburn relaxes at the summer retreat she has known for 25 years. But these familiar shores will soon become unrecognizable. wind came out of the southwest and all hell broke loose. That Rainwater had been driven right into the house. Well, suddenly a wall of water poured through the back door of the little the kitchen. The phone had gone out and we were so scared we couldn't breathe. Tuesday, September 20th, 1938. Along the northeast coast of the United States, families are enjoying the last days of their summer by the shore. We had lots of friends, and it was just innocent children's play. I mean, we bicycled, we went to the movies, we went to the beach, and just had a, it was a lovely, lovely time. In the fishing community of Jamestown, Rhode Island, Norm Caswell takes his usual busload of children home from school. Caswell knows his passengers well, and he knows they're good kids. Though he does have to keep an eye on Clayton Chellis, the lighthouse keeper's 11-year-old son. Clayton Chellis? He was a, a rounder. He was, if it was something to get into, he got into it. <laughs> and uh, he could swim like a seal in the water. One of Clayton's favorite swimming spots is among the jagged rocks surrounding the Beaver Tail Lighthouse where his family lives. But in this weather, Clayton's swim will have to wait for another day. About 40 miles away, on Napa Tree Point in Watch Hill, Rhode Island, the Moore children play at their summer home, a place they call Heaven on Earth. Their father, Jeff Moore, runs a successful elastic factory. A former high school football captain, he once led his team to a 122 to nothing victory. Since his days of gridiron glory, he's bulked up to more than 200 pounds. He's known as a down-to-earth and generous man to both his family and his employees. If a woman was pregnant, needed some money, he reach in his pockets and pull out money, which was like lettuce, and give it to her. Hey, Mom. Hey, sweetie, come on up here. During the summer months, the Moore children notice a difference in their mother, Catherine. You get me wet. Oh, hey, Mom's turn. Of the husband and wife, she was a bit more reserved. But the children said when they got to the shore, um, she was um, a little lighter hearted, a little more fun. They really went there to relax and kick back. The family's three-story home, nestled between Little Narragansett Bay and the Atlantic Ocean, is built on a barrier beach. The barrier beaches are a ribbon of sand that juts right out along the seashore, and behind them is the pond or waterway. It's wonderful living, but they're very, very vulnerable in a storm. Forty miles away, rain is falling in Connecticut. That evening, actress Katherine Hepburn is relaxing in front of the fireplace at her family home in Fenwick. She ponders her tumultuous relationship with movie mogul Howard Hughes, who has recently proposed to her. At that point, Hepburn did not want to marry Hughes. And I think it was mostly because her career was in such a terrible place at that point. And I think it was very important to her to remain independent and to bring herself back. 
For her comeback, she mulls over whether to lobby for the role of Scarlett O'Hara or to star in a new play a friend is writing for her. It was the story of a young woman who had divorced her husband and was about to marry another man. And, and it was what happens during the weekend of that particular wedding. It was, of course, the Philadelphia story. Unbeknownst to Hepburn and millions of others on the Northeast Coast, they are in the crosshairs of a violent hurricane. A tropical disturbance of dangerous proportions. Just one day earlier, meteorologists Grady Norton and Gordon Dunn predicted it was going to hit 1,400 miles south in Miami. They now assume the hurricane will follow a familiar pattern and disintegrate once it hits the cool waters off New England. By 9 p.m., the hurricane is lurking somewhere southeast of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. But instead of dying off, it's growing more powerful due to a rare convergence. When hurricanes get this far north and they begin to interact with a cold front, well, that front represents temperature contrast. So when you put the two together, Mother Nature is trying to get that hurricane to be more like a winter-like system. These temperature contrasts, along with the jet stream, a river of air roaring through the atmosphere, cause the hurricane to grow larger and transform it into what is called an extratropical cyclone. It is a transition that, by definition, can possess remarkable amounts of energy, power in the atmosphere. And if they are directed toward a coastline, it can have dramatic results. The jet stream greatly expands the reach of wind and rain generated by the hurricane, giving it the potential to strike an area more than 500 miles wide. And it helps double the hurricane's speed to over 40 miles an hour. It is now one of the fastest on record, moving so rapidly that it doesn't have time to die out over the cold waters of the North Atlantic. But weather service warnings have cautioned most ships to evacuate the area. And without the sailors' first-hand reports, government meteorologists are unaware that the gigantic storm is racing toward the millions of people who live in the Northeast. Back in Watch Hill, Rhode Island, the Moore children prepare for bed. Mommy, it's been raining a lot lately. Yes, it has. Before going to sleep, eight-year-old Kathy Moore quizzes her mother about the recent spell of rainy weather. The subject was storms, typhoons, and so forth and so on, and my mother was explaining the difference between them to me. Kathy remembers saying, what is a hurricane? And her mother saying, oh, don't worry about it. Hurricanes don't come to New England. People had no clue that one of nature's most powerful historical weather events was about to come crashing ashore. Even veteran forecasters at the Washington, D.C. Weather Bureau are certain that the hurricane will never make landfall. A young meteorologist will discover the storm's actual path. But will anyone listen to his warnings? Winds sounded like railroad locomotives. They howled and screeched and we were defenseless. The houses were swept up river and splinters to the Morton farm. I saw our garage lifted up and dropped into the bay. I had to hold on with both hands against the force. Looks like it could be another Cape Verde. Wednesday, September 21st, 1938. For the past week, meteorologists Grady Norton and Gordon Dunn have been monitoring a storm born near the Cape Verde Islands 
off the coast of Africa. Any other characteristics? From their offices in Jacksonville, they've tracked the hurricane as it narrowly missed the Florida coast and then veered north. The Weather Bureau really believed that the hurricane of 1938 would do what all the others had done, that it would turn and go out to sea and be forgotten. Once it's north of Florida, the hurricane is out of Norton and Dunn's hands. It now falls under the jurisdiction of the Weather Bureau's Washington, D.C. office. How are you doing there, Bill? Hey, Charlie. You got the pressure readings? Yeah. One bright up-and-comer at the D.C. office is 28-year-old junior forecaster Charles Pierce. Pierce is part of a new generation of meteorologists. In 1938, the Weather Bureau had a tradition of uh, forecasting by experience. And about that period of time, there was a new school of forecasting that would look at frontal analysis uh, and air masses. And that was something different than what had been the tradition of the Weather Bureau up till that time. This new school was more systematic than their seasoned counterparts using physics and mathematical formulas to predict weather patterns. Pierce has the benefit of these new scientific theories, but he has only seen a few hurricanes. It's th 32 that meant that he was going to pay more attention to the actual data at hand and be less biased by the fact that storms in that area turned a certain way and wound up in a certain location. On the morning of September 21st, people up and down the northeast coast enjoy one of the last days of summer. West Hampton Beach, Long Island. When are the kids coming over? The Green family has spent the summer relaxing in their beachfront home. Todd Green's husband is at work in New York City. Hi there. Margaret and Otis and Patricia, come on in. It had been raining off and on for days. To keep her son and daughter occupied, Todd organizes an end of summer gathering. Mrs. Green uh, said that the kids were bored because it had been raining an awful lot. Uh, so she just uh, makeshifted this, this party to keep them occupied because they, they couldn't go out. Across Long Island Sound in Fenwick, Connecticut, Catherine Hepburn decides to get in nine holes of golf on the local course. And by the time she tees off on the final hole, she's having the game of her life. She, you know, whacked the ball and they couldn't find it, where it had gone. And anyway, they went looking and there in the hole, Catherine Hepburn had hit a hole in one that day. It was her first. She finishes with a score of 31, a personal best. On the island of Jamestown in Rhode Island, bus driver Norm Caswell has his normal load of nine kids in the back of his school bus. You all sit down and behave yourself. As usual, Clayton Chellis is acting up while the rest of the children are well behaved. 12 p.m. At the Moore House in Watch Hill, Rhode Island, the family sits down to lunch. Outside, the wind is whipping whitecaps across Little Narragansett Bay. 12-year-old Jeffrey Moore Jr. notices something strange. The sky was orange. I had never seen a sky like that before. And there were black wisps of cloud scooting through this. Thought maybe it was the devil. Is she OK? Yeah, just a little warm, just warm. His father, Jeff Moore Sr., doesn't even notice the ominous weather. 
The 40-year-old has had shooting pain in his chest all day. Jeffrey? As the family finishes up lunch, Jeff suddenly slumps over. Jeffrey! 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 Catherine immediately calls the doctor. The children are terrified. To see that uh, big man ready to die scared the hell out of me. Moore is having a heart attack. At the Washington, D.C. Weather Bureau, Charles Pierce has been spending the morning meticulously poring over barometric maps and temperature data. He's tracking the hurricane that had skirted Florida the day before. The most recent reports place it nearly 150 miles out to sea and have downgraded the storm to a tropical disturbance. But a few things strike Pierce as odd. First is a radio report from a luxury liner. The captain had heeded weather service warnings and hugged the Virginia coast to avoid the storm. Nevertheless, high seas and heavy winds buffet his ship. When this ship report came in, this should have been a key which told the Washington forecasters that the storm is much farther to the west. A barometer reading near 30 denotes a clear day. Anything under 29 is an indication of a powerful storm. Just had a report from a ship called the Corinthia. The ship reports a barometric reading of 27.85 inches, a near record low for the North Atlantic. Another troubling sign. Pierce notices that a typically stable mass of high pressure off Bermuda in the Western Atlantic is in an unusual position. It was farther north than normal and a little bit farther to the west, which meant that the storm was allowed to turn north but could never make that northeastern turn back out into the ocean. Finally, Pierce notes that another high-pressure zone is hovering over the Allegheny Mountains. Pierce believes this confluence of factors is a recipe for disaster. The two high-pressure zones are blocking the storm on both sides, forcing it to head closer and closer to land. Where are you going? I've got to go and see Mitchell. What for? In spring right now. Really? I think we've got a hurricane on our hands. He wants to tell his superiors they're wrong about the storm's path. At noon, he informs senior forecasters that it's barreling towards the northeast coast. There is something about these new forecasts. Basically, they told him, we are the meteorologists, we have the final say, and when we want your opinion, we'll ask you, thank you very much, and proceeded to ignore his comments. If the winds are Do you realize south here, how many years of experience you are standing between here? The veteran forecasters have seen dozens of these storms and know their patterns. They were following conventional wisdom that hurricanes, as they, tra as they uh, travel north, get pushed out to sea by the prevailing westerly winds. They think of him as the young upstart, and they see his prediction as bold and foolish. Please leave. Uh, would you at least Please look at the maps? Sir? Leave. Tell me you'll at least... In the 2 p.m. advisory out of the D.C. office, there is no mention of the word hurricane. Within the next few hours, forecasters will learn just how wrong they are. Back in Watch Hill, Rhode Island, as ocean waters begin to stir outside, Jeff Moore is in bed. He's had a mild heart attack and is following the doctor's orders of rest with no excitement or exertion. Within the hour, the Moore family and millions of people up and down the northeast coast will have nowhere to run.
Wednesday, September 21st, 1938. A rampaging hurricane with 100 mile an hour winds is tearing up the Atlantic Ocean toward the New England coast. The hurricane's raging speed combines with its sustained winds to increase its deadly power. If you've got a storm with highest winds of 100 miles an hour and it's moving at 50 miles an hour, well, then you have the additive effect of almost a 150 mile an hour hurricane. Around 2 p.m., the hurricane grazes the coast of New Jersey. Sea spray careens over the steel pier in Atlantic City. And enormous waves shred the famous boardwalks along the Jersey shore. In New York City, wind gusts of 120 miles an hour cause the Empire State Building to sway. But even those feeling its power have no idea that this storm is actually a hurricane. Storm clouds gather in Fenwick, Connecticut. Unaware of the danger, Catherine Hepburn takes to the water for her daily swim. The tide was really stiff, and she said, gee, you know, I mean, the, the tide is really <laughs> controlling me here. And she thought, this is very challenging. This is wonderful. By 2.30 p.m., the storm is less than 50 miles from Long Island. It was very sneaky. It stayed just far enough offshore that the people on the beaches that were having church picnics and going down there to watch the waves couldn't see it. It was just out there waiting to turn and, and hit them. Back in Fenwick, Connecticut, Catherine Hepburn swims in turbulent waters. The tides were really getting a little more fierce. Uh, the wind was actually beginning to blow sand. It dawned on her, maybe this is not just another storm, that this is something extraordinary. By the time she reaches her home, the surf is crashing over the seawall and onto the lawn. Waves near the family home are nothing compared to what is brewing just offshore. One of nature's most devastating forces, the storm surge. Storm surge is the piling up of water along the coastline caused by the force of the winds against the ocean's surface. As you force that water up the bays, the inlets, the estuaries, it's like filling a bathtub. You are surrounded on three sides. That water has only one place to go, up in its elevation. It is this deadly wall of water that typically causes at least three quarters of a hurricane's fatalities. Today, this effect will be amplified by the tides, which are at their peak. September 21st represents the fall equinox. That is a time when we expect high astronomical tides. Atop that, we had a full moon. We know that full moons provide a little extra energy. We have higher tides associated with our full moons. You couldn't have had it set up any worse. In West Hampton Beach, Long Island, five children enjoy an end of summer party at the Green family home while rain pours outside. Eight-year-old Margaret Bradley and her six-year-old brother Otis are fascinated by the stormy weather. Pretty soon after we arrived there, the wind started blowing, and parts of the house started blowing off, and that was very interesting. And we were all aware that something was happening, but we weren't sure what. Well, the weather's getting pretty bad. I think you better call your parents and come pick you up, don't you think? With conditions becoming dangerous, Todd Green tries to contact the children's parents. 
The phone is dead. Hello. Uh-oh. Then the lights go out. One hundred mile an hour winds are whipping through the trees. It is just before 3 p.m. The full force of this brutal hurricane slams into the coast with astonishing strength. There's a knock on the Green's front door. Who's here? Eleven neighbors stand shivering on the porch. Oh, my God. They came from other houses because the greenhouse was uh, a larger one. Uh, there were a lot of beach cottages that were only one story or didn't have an attic. And their house looks sturdier. Seventy-five miles across Long Island Sound in Watch Hill, Rhode Island, a servant has driven Anne and Kathy Moore home from school. The two girls breathlessly recount their adventurous ride home through the wind and rain. They thought this was extraordinarily exciting, the wind out and this question that the car was perhaps going to blow off the road. Suddenly, waves and screaming winds pound the house, shattering windows. Exhilaration turns to terror. The hurricane is upon them. Within minutes, water and debris pummel the house as high as the second story. Jeff Moore, who earlier that day suffered a minor heart attack, is summoned from his bed to help nail shutters over broken windows. Downstairs, Catherine gathers food and other supplies. When she opens the basement door, she's shocked to discover that it's already flooded. With the water rising rapidly, there is no escape. Jeffrey! That is when the moments of stark terror came because they could see what the water could do. There was no ready exit and you knew in that situation that this was going to be a matter of sheer survival. Forty miles east in Jamestown, Rhode Island, rain pours onto the already saturated ground. At around 3 p.m., bus driver Norm Caswell carefully maneuvers his vehicle over the waterlogged roads after picking his passengers up from school. He notices that one of the children, 16-year-old Bill Chellis, is absent. He was downtown and he was waiting for the bus to pick him up, to bring him back up to um, the lighthouse. And some friends went by in a car and said, Hey, Bill, want, me, want to go up to the lighthouse? Uh, we're going to go up and look at the sea. There's big waves up there. I said, sure. With eight children on board, Caswell heads out in the high winds and driving rain. The bus will be their only protection against a 20-foot wall of water that will ravage cities, homes, and families. September 21st, 1938, 3 p.m. The northeast coast of the United States is caught in the jaws of a monstrous hurricane with 100 mile an hour winds. It is the worst in this region in more than a century. At 60 miles an hour, the hurricane is moving so fast that its eye, usually a respite from the storm, hardly provides a break. Waves as high as 50 feet strike the coast with such force that they register on seismographs in Alaska. And still, forecasts do not mention the word hurricane. Even if they had, the storm knocked out communications as soon as it sped ashore. So as the forecasters were trying to keep up with the storm, the storm was actually coming on shore in Long Island and just as the forecast was being changed, uh, people were being drowned in downtown Providence, Rhode Island. Around 3.30 p.m., 
a 20-foot storm surge as high as a two-story building smashes into the coastline. Witnesses talk about this massive black water. It's almost like a huge wall in front of them that all of a sudden dominates their landscape and then crashes upon them with a thunder. The earth shakes like the gates of hell are falling upon you. In West Hampton Beach, Long Island, 11 neighbors have sought shelter in Tot Green's wood frame home. But it is no protection against the storm surge. The water started to roll over the dunes. And my recollection is it was just wave after wave after wave coming in, and you could see them getting higher and higher. The whole ocean floor was sucked out to the horizons. So you, it was just as if there was a skim of water all the way out to the horizon. And then suddenly this huge unbroken wall of water started coming, just rolling towards us. As the storm surge hits, the ground floor fills with water. Tot orders everyone upstairs. She only has a single life jacket. She must make a gut-wrenching decision. You've got your own children there. You want to protect them. But I think that you always feel a certain duty to protect the children that you've been entrusted with. Todd gives the life vest to the Bradley kids and suggests that Otis, the younger sibling, wear it. Ladies first. I said, no. I said, it's ladies first. Yeah, I didn't deny him the lifesaver because I didn't like him. It was because I felt I, ladies first, was just a credo that I'd been brought up with. Now the storm surge inundates the second floor. The water just kept coming and coming and coming, and we went up another flight to the attic. The next flight would have been to heaven. 40 miles away in Fenwick, Connecticut, relentless waves pound Catherine Hepburn's summer home. Under the fierce attack, windows shatter, and the walls begin to crumble. Windows were imploding. Doors were swinging and falling off hinges. Catherine Hepburn uh, had the fear of God running through her. Wait, wait, Dick! Dick! One wing of the house literally came off and just disappeared. And at this point, those who were left in the house decided it's time to get out. The storm's intensifying. The house is coming apart. We need to get out of here now. Hepburn, her mother, brother, a house guest and the cook are all trapped. Go, 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 go. Catherine's brother Dick throws a rope out the dining room window. He and the four others climb down into the churning knee-deep water. Seventy miles east in Jamestown, Rhode Island, bus driver Norman Caswell reaches a narrow one-lane causeway. But the road, which usually separates two coves, is now overrun by water. Caswell is a quarter mile away from his next stop, the home of Joe Matos. He is the father of four of the children on the bus. Matos is on the far side of the causeway, where his car has stalled in the floodwaters. He wants to make sure Norman Caswell doesn't make the same mistake. Joe uh, Matos was at the corner of his property, and he tried to flag down uh, Norman Caswell to let him know of the impending danger. He tried to flag him, but it was uh, very foggy at that point. The surf was up, the wind was up. Through the blinding rain, Caswell creeps across the washed-out road. Halfway across the causeway, his bus stalls. You need to go sit down right now. He and the children are now surrounded by the swirling water. 
Fearing they will be swept away, Caswell decides the children will be safer if they leave the bus and head for the Mato's house on foot. He believes it is the only way to protect the children. He got out of the bus. At that point, the wind was knocking him over, and he made it to the back of the bus. And he opened the door. Joe Matos watches from atop high ground at the end of his property. It's okay. As one by one, the children jump out of the bus. Stand up. Come on, you go, you go. Come on down. Then, through the salty spray, Matos spots a towering wall of water barreling toward the causeway Daddy. and his children. Forty miles away in Watch Hill, Rhode Island, seawater has now engulfed the first floor of the Moore family's three-story home. Over here, over here. From the second story, the family watches the storm surge wash away the home next door. Moments later, a teenage neighbor bursts into the room. They said, where is your family? He said, they're gone. And then it all hit them that what gone meant was really gone. We'll the emotional here. shock of seeing loved ones before their very eyes washed out to sea and drowned, they hadn't even begun to deal with. They couldn't take time for it. Without warning, the second floor begins to fall like a trap door. The house is collapsing beneath them. The rising water drives all 11 people to the attic. Two of the Moore girls begin to recite the Catholic act of contrition. Their sister, Kathy, clutches her rosary. It's OK, sweetie. It's OK. okay? We firmly believed in in heaven. And I guess we thought we were very good children because we were quite sure that we were going to heaven if we died. Okay, I promise we're all together. Twelve-year-old Jeffrey Moore readies himself to drown. Oh, we're gonna make it, we're gonna make it. I was deciding whether I would do it quickly, <gasps> like that, or whether I'd fight it. And I decided I'd do it quickly. His father, Jeff, says goodbye to his wife of 13 years. It was basically the, this is the end and I, I love you moment. But Catherine would not go there. She would not take that step. She was not quite willing to give it all up. You need to be strong. You need to be with us, all of us. Suddenly, water rises to the floor and a fierce blast of wind rips a section of the attic away from the house. The house breaks apart before their very eyes. It's almost biblical. The floor becomes a raft. Everything underneath us, all the underpinnings, uh, broke up. And it seemed like all of a sudden, there we were. Sailing, sailing on the house. All that remains is a section of floor with two iron pipes sticking up and a piece of roof. Jeff Moore grabs one of the pipes and the rest of the group hangs onto it. Massive waves push the attic floor into Little Narragansett Bay. The family has no idea where they are headed or if they will survive. It 
It is late afternoon on September 21st, 1938. And a ferocious hurricane has taken the northeastern United States completely by surprise. With no time to take cover, millions of people have been swept into the maelstrom. And the storm has found ideal conditions when it crashes ashore. Normally, hurricanes fade quickly when they leave the ocean, deprived of the warm water that is their fuel. This time is different. The four days preceding the hurricane, there had been pretty steady, hard rainfall. There was widespread flooding. New England was essentially a warm pool of shallow water. The hurricane continued to travel on land as if it was believing it was on water. The storm's violent winds and 20-foot storm surge flattened the New England coast. The Blue Hill Weather Observatory near Boston registers wind gusts of 186 miles an hour. Then, the instrument measuring the wind speed breaks. New London, Connecticut is under eight feet of water. Severed power lines ignite buildings, creating an inferno. Providence, Rhode Island is engulfed with water as Narragansett Bay rips ashore. It was almost as if you had turned on a spigot in a glass of water. The water rose that quickly through the streets of Providence. West Hampton Beach on the south shore of Long Island has already been hit by the storm surge. Okay, we have everyone. We have to stay calm. We're going to find a way out of it. Todd Green, her two children, and 14 others huddled together in the attic. Everybody was scared to death. Nobody was really talking back and forth. We were just all sitting there, sort of stupefied. The house is getting pummeled with huge waves. Chunks of debris are flying into the house. They fear that their roof is going to rip off. Using a crowbar, some of the men punch a hole in the roof. If the water rises much more, it will be their final exit. Off the coast of Napa Tree Point in Watch Hill, Rhode Island, the Moore family and their servants cling to a makeshift raft consisting of their attic floor. And we were just one tight little circle of people holding on to each other with tremendous life-threatening waves. There were just waves crashing over us. And that went on for quite a while. We weren't sure where we were floating, and we were so disoriented. We thought we'd be out in the middle of the ocean, and sure enough, the raft would break up and sink. Catherine Moore remains calm and collected for the sake of her children. She creates a strategy to keep them from swallowing water as waves wash over the raft. My mother would give a signal, and then we all... <gasps> And then when the wave went, whew, and then here comes one, and then whew. In Jamestown, Rhode Island, Norm Caswell's school bus has stalled on a narrow causeway. Afraid the bus will be swept away, he's led the children out into the storm. Six young passengers hold hands, creating a human chain as they struggle through the water. Caswell is carrying the two youngest children in his arms. Nearby, Joe Matos watches helplessly as the 20-foot storm surge heads right toward the bus and his four children. Then there's this huge inundation and there's a sense of chaos and all of a sudden the whole area is underwater. Uh, the human chain breaks in the middle, uh, probably among the, the weakest of the children, and it washes the children away. 
the water was, knocking the bus into the waterway on the other side, the screaming that was going on, children grabbing for one another, grabbing for anything. A horror unimaginable for these children. Meanwhile, Catherine Hepburn and four others brace against the torrential rains and piercing winds as they trudge through knee-deep water. They are searching for higher ground after barely escaping from the family's crumbling summer home. They literally watched their house come off of the piles and just float down a brook that basically connected a little lagoon on one side of the Hepburn house to Long Island Sound on the other. For Catherine Hepburn, the house sort of represented the family history. And to watch the house be destroyed was in many ways to watch that history get wiped away. Forty miles away, the sea continues to punish the Moore family's makeshift raft. Somehow, we managed to hang on and not be washed off. Suddenly, 12-year-old Jeffrey sees a pair of sharks circling the raft. The sharks were panheads. I had seen them with a tuna. And they take a tuna in one bite. And uh, I didn't want to be in the water with those babies. Strangers in an unfamiliar sea, the moors are at the mercy of the storm. Up and down the North Atlantic shore, millions of people are feeling the same shock and confusion as the hurricane roars on. Early evening, September 21st, 1938. A hurricane is slamming into New England and Long Island. With wind speeds over 120 miles an hour and a mammoth storm surge, it's what would later be characterized as a Category 3 storm. In Jamestown, Rhode Island, Joseph Matos watches in horror as the violent surge pushes his children into the churning waters. He is at the edge of his property, looking down on the bus his children have fled. But he is completely helpless. He just couldn't get there. And, you know, I'm sure he was yelling in the, the um, wind, but you couldn't hear it. And another wave came. It's unclear exactly what's happening. Uh, what is clear is that his children are getting washed away, uh, and it's not certain that he's ever going to be able to find them. The fast-moving storm strikes cities and towns up and down the New England coastline. Homes are washed out to sea, streets obliterated by wreckage, hundreds killed. Finally, after two hours, the waves begin to calm. Floating on a section of their house, the Moore family is relieved to spot a familiar location. In the distance, the Moors recognize a small piece of land called Barn Island. On any other day, it's an easy one-mile sail from their home. Well, that all fear went from me. The next thing was how we're gonna how we're gonna land if we could. Maybe we might have to swim for it. I didn't. We didn't know. The raft gets close enough to the island for the passengers to walk to shore. After we got off that raft and through the debris uh, and onto the shore, that raft split in two. And you think, oh my, God was with us or someone, some higher power was with us because that could have happened in the middle of the bay. 
The worst part of the hurricane is now over, but winds are still strong. They were soaked to the skin, they were freezing cold, and they realized they were going to have to spend the night there. They had no idea that the hurricane had been so destructive along the entire coast. They thought it was just their area. Barefoot, the Moors and their servants trek through jagged debris and briars in search of shelter. They finally settle on some haystacks and fall asleep. It was a miracle that we were on that cluttered up, cold, windy island. I mean, it was a little bit of heaven that night. West Hampton Beach, Long Island. Around 5 p.m., the wind and rain have died down. Todd Green and the 16 people who had sought refuge in her attic decide to venture outside to find safer shelter. The landscape had changed rather radically. Houses that had been there hours before were washed away. Um, sand had moved. It was hard to get your bearings and your location. The men hoist the children onto their backs as the group walks through water thick with debris. Sopping wet and freezing cold, they head toward a stone house still standing down the road. By midnight, after traveling more than 300 miles over land, the great hurricane moves north into Canada. Deprived of the ocean water it needs to survive, it weakens and dies. September 22, 1938. The northeast coast of North America wakes up to a glorious sunrise. Ernest Hemingway wrote in The Old Man in the Sea, something along the lines of, there's no more beautiful weather than in hurricane season when you're not having a hurricane. September 22 is this brilliant day, but what is on the ground is chaos, Armageddon. Some take advantage of the disorder by looting stores and robbing corpses. There's a, a sense of desperation that is based in the depression. You know, the poverty is so deep and, and so enduring that perhaps many people see this brief window of opportunity to escape that poverty. States respond immediately by imposing martial law and dispatching the National Guard to handle the disorder. Some troops are issued shoot-to-kill orders to deal with looters. On Barn Island, where Jeffrey Moore Jr. and his family found refuge, they wake up from their haystack beds. I heard this putt, 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 putt. I know what that was. That was a fishing boat. In the debris, young Jeffrey finds a mirror to signal the boat. As it approaches in the distance, the Moore family can see Napa Tree Point, where their summer home once stood. Napa Tree Point was really wiped off the face of the earth. The, the sand was there, the point was there, but the houses were all washed away. I can't imagine how it felt to my parents. Their wonderful, wonderful house that they had built, their love of the sea, the love of the location, the wonderful neighbors, the life we had led there, simply gone. On Long Island, the Green family returns to the site of their home on Dune Road. It is in ruins. But the next morning, a local paper reminds them just how lucky they are. 
An article claims that Tot and the entire group of people she was sheltering had been swept out to sea. As the waves wash against the abandoned school bus in Jamestown, Rhode Island, an entire region wonders why they were not warned. September 22, 1938. A hurricane of unprecedented speed and ferocity has laid waste to more than a thousand miles of shoreline, from Long Island to Maine. It's like a world turned upside down. Railroad tracks that are just sort of spiraling into nothingness. Sailboats washed up on land. Cars bobbing in, in water. Um, neighborhoods that are just that have just become splinters the storm destroyed 20,000 buildings and damaged 75,000 more only 5% of the population has insurance to cover the damage The morning after the hurricane, Catherine Hepburn and her family returned to the ruins of their summer home in Fenwick, Connecticut. There was just rubble and, and just debris everywhere. I mean, not even a sense beyond that, that a house once stood there. Always the actress, Hepburn poses for this photo in a bathtub. Catherine Hepburn was very much on with the show. Fine, you know, we've lost the house, we've got our lives, we've got our health, and fortunately, we can rebuild the house. The people of Jamestown, Rhode Island, face tragic news. Of the eight children who were on board the town school bus the day before, seven are dead. Only bus driver Norm Caswell and 11-year-old Clayton Chellis survived the hurricane. Clayton had been a strong swimmer, and he knew from swimming here at Beavertail that the best thing to do was not fight the water, but to swim with it, which is what he did. That morning, nearly everyone in town gathers around the empty bus, still partially submerged in muddy water. Because the island was so small and everyone knew everyone else, when people discovered that seven children had died the day before, it was devastating not just for the families, but for everybody on the island. As days pass, one by one, the bodies of the tiny victims wash up on Jamestown's shore. It is a scene repeated throughout New England. 682 people have been killed. High schools become makeshift morgues, while undertakers struggle with shortages of embalming fluid and caskets. There was a journalist who said one of the enduring memories was the smell of dead bodies. He almost felt like he could taste it in his food. There were often um, triple funerals, and that was particularly the case with families. A mother would be buried with her small children if they had all drowned. In the storm's wake, tough questions are leveled at the D.C. Weather Bureau. Those in the hurricane's path want to know why they weren't warned. The Weather Bureau said, well, we did announce gale warnings. Gale warnings were discounted. Fishermen were accustomed to gale warnings. They thought that was just a big blow. You know, tie up your boats and close the boathouse. They didn't think that gale warning meant what was going to happen. If the winds are out of the south in Washington, they must be. Please. Just two hours before the hurricane struck, forecaster Charles Pierce had accurately predicted its intensity and its deadly path. But more experienced meteorologists had overruled him. It's not clear if a last-minute warning would have made a difference. 
The storm swept away communication lines as it roared ashore. I think within the Weather Bureau, there was the understanding that this was a very unique storm from the standpoint of its motion, where it went, and more importantly, how fast it got there. The public blames the agency for the lack of warning. One critical letter prompts the senior forecaster in Washington to respond that they handle the situation, quote, fairly well under the circumstances. No one at the Weather Bureau lost his job after the storm. One thing that does change in the aftermath of the New England hurricane, the way in which the recovery is handled. Traditionally, private agencies like the Red Cross spearheaded relief efforts. But in the 1930s, President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal programs become the cornerstone of the relief efforts. The Depression makes it impossible for private charity to keep up with the demand. So what we see happening in New England is the federal government stepping in and taking the place of either private charity or state or local government as a way of giving aid or trying to generate economic growth, which is what the New Deal is trying to do. Tens of thousands of unemployed men found themselves back at work again because of the hurricane. There was another unexpected beneficiary of the hurricane, the airline industry. People who've never flown before are getting on planes. The streets are choked with, with fallen trees, with debris. Same for railroad lines, which are absolutely torn up and destroyed. All of a sudden, there's a huge demand for flights. Jeff Moore, who rode out the storm with his family, cheated death twice by surviving a heart attack and the hurricane. His luck runs out 18 months later when he dies from complications after surgery. He was just 42 years old. He went out so fast that he could only say a few things, including the say goodbye when to my sweetheart. His sweetheart, Catherine, never remarries. The only meteorologist to predict the storm's probable landfall in New England was Charles Pierce. He spends nearly four decades with the Weather Service until his retirement in 1973. Joseph Matos, who lost four children at the causeway, stays in Jamestown, Rhode Island for the rest of his life. He never would talk much about this. He would break down when he did talk about it, naturally. He never got over it, but he had to live his whole life with it. Clayton Chellis, who was able to swim to safety during the storm, follows his love of the sea by joining the Navy right out of high school. After serving in the Pacific Theater during World War II, he drowns. He was 19 years old. Ironically, the one person who survived this bus tragedy but because of his swimming ability ends up drowning. It's almost as if fate had written some kind of script and it didn't get him the first time, but it did the second. Most residents of Jamestown forgive bus driver Norm Caswell for his actions, believing he had the best interests of the children in mind. Some, however, like Bill Chellis, who was not on the bus, but lost his sister in the hurricane, can't help but still be angry. Well, a stupid, dirty devil should have never tried to go across a one-lane causeway. Just, you, you couldn't even pass two cars. I don't know what the man was thinking of. Of course, you know, hindsight's a great thing, but... <laughs> no one was harder on Caswell than himself. He became uh, not the amiable chap people have remembered before the hurricane, but a morose type of fellow didn't want to talk to people. 
And he just he just couldn't deal with it. Plagued by depression, he dies eight years after the storm at the age of 54. In the end, Catherine Hepburn does not marry Howard Hughes. Nor does she get the part of Scarlet in Gone with the Wind. The great hurricane of 1938 does, however, mark a crossroads in her life. Just as she rebuilt that house, just as she wanted it, she rebuilt her career, starting with the Philadelphia story. And after that, she really became the grand dame of American movies. Her family home on the Connecticut shore remains Catherine Hepburn's refuge from the world for the rest of her life. She dies there in 2003 at the age of 96. Today, meteorologists agree that another hurricane on par with the 1938 storm will likely strike the northeastern United States someday. The question is whether it will result in an equally large loss of life. Radar, developed during World War II and refined over the years, now allows meteorologists to track a storm with pinpoint accuracy. What they still cannot do is predict its behavior, what path it will take, and whether it will die out or grow to monstrous proportions. Intensity forecasting is probably the least efficient and the least known part of hurricane forecasting. So that meteorological nightmare is still out there, and if we're not careful to learn from what we've seen in the past, that kind of thing could be repeated along the United States coast in some shape or form. If anything, more people in the American Northeast may be in danger from a hurricane than ever before. Waterfronts and beaches that were empty in 1938 are now crowded with development. More and more people live in harm's way. And I think, wow, you know, what are you doing building houses? Uh, and it just, someday, something's going to happen. But there it is. People forget. We feel it hasn't happened in two generations. It can't happen now. So we have an inexperienced population. Is our infrastructure different? Sure. Have we matured as a society? Sure. But are we any less susceptible to the devastation? Absolutely not. Storms like this have a way of making all of the technology that people enjoy obsolete. And just when you think you have established the ideal world where you can do everything, a storm like this comes along and shows you how completely powerless you are in the face of nature. <laughs>